Hi friends. So welcome to the GOAT debate. Now I may have posted a video a few years back around this, but uh, this is this has now changed because the players have performed since then and they have won more Grand Slams, more tournaments, and it's still ongoing process because Djokovic, Nadal, Federer, all three are still active on the tour and they can win more tournaments, create new factors. So it's still an ongoing process. And what I've done in this video is I've tried to accumulate all the factors that I think, in my personal opinion, uh, you know, should be considered when we talk about the GOAT debate. And your results might be different. It's, it's just a matter of personal opinion. So let's begin. Now, the factors that have been considered in this GOAT debate is the technical game. Of course, that's important. Then the physical aspects, the strategical aspects, the records, their head-to-head -head records as well, the versatility, mental aspects, consistency, surface adaptability, and also the era adaptability. Now, what is era adaptability? Because we have seen Federer you know, playing from 1998 or 1999, and it's been 20 years since then. So what I'm trying to describe here is, the court surfaces have changed over the years. The racket technology has also changed. The ball technology has also changed. So who is the player who has been consistent and played well in all those conditions? So that factor also I have tried to consider. Now, a few points to remember before we start this analysis. And this video is going to be a long video because we'll try to cover as many factors as we can. And uh, the scores that I have given are out of 10 most of the times, and it's based on my personal opinion completely. So I would say how you could utilize this video is take all those factors that I've mentioned into account, give them your own points, how you feel, what you think, and then just see, it will be interesting to see what your analysis, what your understanding brings out and who comes out on top based on your points. And let me tell you that this is also a statistical analysis. so. Uh, I mean, I would not try to be philosophical here, but the heart says something else and the mind says something else, right? So maybe in your heart you like one player and you want him to be the greatest ever, and but then there are stats that prove otherwise. So you need to consider it and it's a hypothetical question, it's subjective, it's based on your opinion, there is no set answer. I keep repeating these things because uh, a lot of times on social media I've seen people, you know, fighting with each other and because of, you know, this gold debate and everybody knows or should know that this is a subjective topic and because I like one player, definitely I will want him to be the GOAT and I'll try to create new factors or bring in the factors which may not be important for others but I'll try to bring in those factors because I want to provide some points or win the gold debate for that particular player because I like that player more. So that is also a fact that we should consider. And okay, so I think let's begin. Okay, so in the first analysis, what we have taken into consideration is the technical game. So now here you can see on the screen, I have listed all the shots that I think are important. And uh, I have given points out of 10 in those uh, shots so we have the forehand backhand serve volley the approach shot slice drop shot lob drive volley overhead then all we also have the special shots like saber for federer we have chip and charge we have tweener the banana shot the passing shot and the return of serve and so if we start off with the forehand i think federer's forehand wins uh, between these three guys and this is based on his performance on all surfaces from the day one when he started to play till now. So I think Federer's forehand is a thing of beauty and not even, uh, you know, not only in terms of its technical aspect, the technique is very good on his forehand, but also the fact that he can hit with a lot of topspin and also very flat. Usually he hits flatter, but we have seen at the French Open, he is able to adjust his forehand likewise and then he performs well. Now, I have not given Federer 10 points here, 10 out of 10, because sometimes his forehand doesn't work, and that is off late. I mean, when he started playing tennis, when you see his dominant years, 2004 to 2007, his forehand was just amazing. 
there was hardly any bad day for him but then now in the recent years we have seen in some of the matches maybe due to the wind conditions maybe due to the different court surfaces his forehand sometimes doesn't work and when it doesn't work usually he loses the match whereas we have nadal and djokovic who are good in that respect because they hit with a lot of top spin so so they have more margin for error so even if their timing is not right or if they are playing on different surfaces they have that margin of error because their forehand you know the their technique allows them to hit safer shot but when you talk about the shot making ability the winner hitting ability i think federer's forehand should win this battle so in my opinion i have given federer 9 points on the forehand on the backhand side i have given 7 to federer because we all know that it's a good shot but as compared to nadal and djokovic it's definitely his weaker wing and the reason being uh, you know on in the french open we have seen it it can be exploited and it's natural it's not like federer can do something and improve his backhand because his backhand is already very good but the fact is it's it's a natural uh, i would say natural issue that we have with the single handed backhand that on clay it's exploited now we do have a few exceptions like wawrinka who hits a very very good backhand even on clay because his technique is different he goes back he sets up and hits the ball whereas feder usually tries to take the ball on the rise and uh, his technique is different his grip is different so that's why the difference is there so i would give 7 points to feder and then 8 to nadal and 9 to djokovic because djokovic's backhand i think is his best shot and it's better than all the three of these guys then we have the serve of course no issues no argument there federer leads in the serve department then we have the volley uh, djokovic i have given 7 because sometimes in bigger moments in critical moments he has missed a few easy volleys now you might say nadal also missed a volley in the french open recently against djokovic in the third set tie break but more or less nadal doesn't give that away doesn't make that mistake so it's based on the overall performances of these players over the years i think nadal is a better volleyer than djokovic not because of his technique but because of every other factor when to come into the net what is the right shot to hit what is the right volley to hit all that things comes under the anticipation so i think in that regard nadal wins uh, against djokovic and federer of course is given 9 points in the volley department because he has used it the most uh, even from the day 1 he used to serve and volley in the earlier days when he played wimbledon he beat sampras and he started off his career by playing really aggressive so volley was a part of his game he used to volley a lot and even after his peak years when he faced nadal and djokovic he knew that he could not chase down a lot of balls he had to shorten up the rallies and hence he also needed to use the volley at that time and i think he hits it better than nadal and djokovic his anticipation or the point where he needs to come forward may not be best his judgment may not be the best because we have seen a lot of times that he comes on inappropriate approach shots i should say uh, and that is why he gets passed a lot of times in recent years but when he was in in his prime he usually came to the net with a lot of authority and he had time to hit the volley anyway so let's move to the next point which is the approach shot i have given nadal and federer the same thing djokovic is a bit less and then we have the slice so again federer has the most variety on of on uh, in the slice shot even in the return whether it is a flat slice whether it is a slice that is loopy or it is a drop shot whatever it is things slice uh, should go to federer then we have the drop shot now nobody hits more drop shots than djokovic so i have given djokovic that uh, advantage and even if you see the last couple of matches at the french open djokovic usually uses the drop shots in very big points critical points and it is so difficult to execute that shot when it's a pressure point you can do it in on uh, 40 love you can do it on 40 15 but to be able to do it on advantage of the other guy that is facing a break point or in a tie break it is so difficult and i think djokovic has been doing that for years and years now so definitely he should be given credit for that then we have the lob so again djokovic has hit a lot of lobs mare i think is the best uh, in the lot in that category but because he is not part of this debate so i have given 9 points to djokovic 
and then we have the drive volley i think both nadal and federer are able to hit good drive volleys and djokovic i have given 7 because he usually struggles we have seen this overall in this tournament in the french open and throughout the years that drive volley because the ball is in the air he usually struggles he hits the net sometimes he hits the ball outside and even when he hits the drive volley correctly it's not uh, usually uh, you know uh, towards the baseline or towards the sideline i mean it's not a exact winner sometimes he just returns the ball to the court and the other guy is still in the point like nadal many a times he is able to chase down the drive volleys from djokovic and on a similar note we have the overhead and smash and that is definitely a weakness of djokovic that is why i have given him 6 points because i was actually disappointed the way he hit the smash in the final and also in the semi final and throughout his career if you see the matches i would say smash is the one shot i mean the djokovic is the most complete player i would say in terms of the shot making ability but then his smash is is his weaker wing because we have seen time and time again whenever he is provided with a little bit uh, difficult smash he usually misses the smash and uh, that is why we have given him 6 points then we have 9 for nadal because nadal arguably has the best overhead in the world and you can see numerous examples whatever be the case whether it is a pressure point and how many no matter how many smashes or from what position he has to hit 95 to 96% of the time nadal usually hits a very good overhead and he has a very good sense of uh, understanding a good anticipation because he knows whether he needs to allow the ball to bounce or he needs to take the overhead directly whatever the case he understands what needs to be done and technically he hits textbook smash so i think his technique is also the best that is why we are given him 9 points now we come to the special points so we have the saber so just one point to federer because usually the other guys have not used it it's it's an invention we should say for from federer then we have the chip and charge djokovic and nadal usually don't use this shot federer uses this often and this is also an important shot which is not used much nowadays but it's still there then we have the twinner again we have given federer this shot then we have the banana shot of course only nadal hits that shot so we have given him the point passing shot now this is not a special shot everyone has to hit passing shots and i have given nadal the advantage here because of the amount of spin he gets on his forehand passing shot first of first of all whether it is cross court or whether it is down the line he hits the ball outside and it seems always that the ball is going to land outside the court but suddenly you know the spin brings it in and that also happens uh, when you talk about the depth of his shot a lot of times we feel that the ball will go outside the court bounce outside the baseline but it usually just bounces within the line due to the amount of top spin obviously that he hit hits so i think passing shot should be given to nadal and also on the backhand side nadal's passing shot is rock solid whether it is down the line or whether it is cross court because he is a righty he uses his bottom hand to hit the passing shots and it's very very precise in the big moments as well and then we have federer at 7 and djokovic at 8 then we have the return of serve again no questions there djokovic leads in that department he has got 10 points out of 10 he is arguably the best returner in the game and you can see even in the matches at french open or wimbledon i mean he can hit the return from any position and it's usually a very deep return aggressive return and for example i think you have all seen the 2011 us open final he was match points down and he hit an amazing return and he has done that several times you, i'll give you one more example against songa in wimbledon i don't remember the year but you can see he hit a amazing backhand return for a winner okay so when you do the summation of all these points you see that federer and nadal are both tied at 98 points where djokovic is at 95 now people say that djokovic is the most complete player i agree with that but this statistics that you see on the screen is based on all the different shots now maybe the smash uh, is not a shot which is used in every game or every point saber chip and charge all these shots are used seldom okay but uh, the the fact is in this analysis i have just given equal weightage to each shot otherwise we would have a different result so again it's up to you you can use these factors and give your 
you can remove some factors from this list or add some more so let's move on to the next statistic so now on the screen we have the surface statistics so we have the clay grass the outdoor hard courts and indoor hard courts and why i have differentiated between outdoor and indoor hard courts because the conditions are a bit different and outdoor hard courts i would say Djokovic has the advantage even against Federer whereas on indoor hard courts because the court plays quicker whatever be the surface there is no wind no disturbance and Federer loves those kind of conditions so that is why you can see on indoor hard courts Federer has been given 9 points whereas on outdoor hard courts Djokovic has been given 9 points and then we have the grass and the clay now why I have given 9 points to both Djokovic and Federer on grass because simply you can say that Federer has better serve on grass, Federer has better forehand on grass, but then Djokovic has better movement on grass. He is able to slide, he is able to glide on the court and then he has the best return. So even Federer's great serve is neutralized often by Djokovic. Now if you see his matches in Wimbledon and by the way Djokovic uh, leads against Federer in Wimbledon. He has won more matches. Okay, So that is also an interesting fact. And why I'm saying this is because if you see the matches in 2015, 2014, specifically let's pick up an example. Let's say 2015, the semi-final against Murray. Now Federer produced a virtuoso performance. He beat Murray in straight sets. It was a very good victory and we all thought that this is the year Djokovic is, go is going to lose against Federer in the final. But then when you saw the final, you saw a completely different Federer. Now people begin to you know question their own understanding. And, and they were not able to differentiate what is the reason, uh, you know, in the semi-final Federer plays so well, he performs exceptionally uh, good and, you know, he wins the match easily. Whereas when he plays against Djokovic, it, it's a different game. And why is it so? Because Djokovic is, uh, Djokovic's power to return, I think that is a very, very important factor. Because Federer, what is the key to his victories in Wimbledon? His serve and his forehand. Now, if you take out the serve, then all that remains is his forehand. Now, if Djokovic, because of his backhand, if he can manage to keep peppering the Federer's backhand, then you can also take the forehand out of the equation. Now, when you to take both those two key factors out of the equation, then Federer will not be good enough at Wimbledon. So, that is why I feel that Djokovic's return of serve weighs, uh, you know, a lot on grass. And that is why I have given nine points to both these guys. Uh, Federer, of course, when he's playing well, when his serve is working, his forehand is working, even if Djokovic returns well, usually Federer has chances to win. And that is why I have not given more points to Djokovic. Nadal, I have given seven points. You all know because he usually struggles on grass. Uh, recently, in the last one or two years, he has actually played really well. But before that, if you see, maybe due to injuries or maybe due to uh, indoor matches that he had to play due to rains, uh, he was losing against some of the non-top ranked players and he usually struggles and he has all himself admitted that uh, it's not good for his knees that tournament uh, because he is struggling with, with that uh, issue from uh, for the majority of his career so anyway we have given him seven points based on his performances then we have the hard course that we have already discussed so the total comes out to be 34 for Djokovic who leads overall in the surface battle then we have Nadal at 32 and then we have, of course, Federer at 33. Then we have the miscellaneous aspects as well here, which is the fan support. Now, some of you might not consider these as factors because they are not like statistical factors. Those are more of subjective again. And whether, you know, fans like a player or not, he can still be the greatest. But still, I have tried to consider these factors as well. And the fan support, of course, goes to Federer. I know Nadal also has a lot of fans. Djokovic also has a lot of fans. But I think overall, if you see over the years, starting from 2004 or 2003, when Federer first got into the Grand Slam victories, I think throughout from that point onwards till now, even till now, I think Federer usually is the fan favorite everywhere he goes. Even in Spain, which is, you know, Nadal's home ground, we see a lot of support for Federer. Okay. Then we have the elegance and class. Again, Federer leads that category. Then we have the shot making. When Federer's forehand and backhand and serve is working, 
he can produce magic on the court that is why i have given him an extra point there the all court game federer and djokovic i have given equal points whereas nadal i have given just one point less so the total you can see it's 38 for federer 33 for nadal and 32 for djokovic now let's come into the other part of the analysis which is the second half so the first half was the technical game and now we have the other factors so the career fitness is one of them the first of them and federer we all know has faced minimum injuries throughout his career that is why we have given him nine points nadal has been given seven points and then djokovic has been given eight points then we have the match fitness so within a match how much stamina these guys have can they play back to back five set matches so there i have given seven points to federer nine to nadal because usually nadal is the guy who can produce equally exceptional performance two days on the trot whenever even if he had he has to play big matches there are many examples you can consider 2009 australian open he had a you know epic match against vardasco in the semi final that lasted around 5 hours then again he had to come back against federer whereas federer got two days of rest nadal got only one day of rest and then he had to come back and again beat federer in 5 hours so that is one of the example and then we have similar examples for djokovic to whom we have given 8 points because he is also a very good player in terms of match fitness he has also been able to come back uh, you know uh, you can say australian open 2012 he beat murray at the semi final and that was also a five set it lasted more than 4 hours then again he was able to beat nadal in the final and that match i think was the longest in the in the history the australian open so that lasted around uh, five and a half or six hours maybe so that is why federer is is you know behind nadal and djokovic in that category because over the years we have seen federer's performance go down when he has to play a very uh, you know lengthy match uh, one of the example is his match against monfields at the us open i think it was 2014 and then when he played silich in the final he's uh, in the semi final his uh, performance was not that good now i am not saying that he lost because of that factor only but it might have affected his performance so anyway then we have the mental strength of course nadal wins this category i have never seen any other player having more mental strength than nadal djokovic is very close that is why we have given him 9 points but the way djokovic gets rattled sometimes like he got yesterday when he lost the first set against tsitsipas in the second set he was completely out his body language was not good this is something that is not seen in nadal even if nadal is losing a set love 5 or uh, even if uh, he is losing a set love 6 or his match point down set point down nadal never shows uh, discomfort or you know disbelief in his own ability he always uses uh, encouraging words he never looks at his camp in disbelief or what he can do he never breaks his racket so the composure, the temperament, uh, the mental strength, all these combined gives uh, more points to Nadal. And then Federer we have given 8 because I think that is uh, something when we compare it to Nadal and Djokovic head to head. Obviously Federer lacks in that category because he has seen, uh, he has lost a lot of matches due to this factor where it was a pressure situation and uh, maybe there was some other uh, you know issues like I, I can give you a lot of examples there was if you see Australian Open 2012 semi-final Federer versus Nadal Federer won the first set in the second set he started well with the break then Nadal hit an amazing passing shot outside the court and there was a break I think because of the fireworks that happened for 15 minutes and when the game started again Federer timing was completely off his game was completely off and then he was not able to come back into the match and he lost three straight uh, sets and similarly on match points we have seen on a lot of occasions that Federer when he is unable to convert one match point he usually loses the match and we have seen this in multiple matches against Tel Potro at the Indian Wells we have seen it against Djokovic in Wimbledon 2019 we have seen it uh, again against uh, 
Nalbandian in the ATP Masters Finals in 2005, where he was just two points away. He had the break in the fifth set. He was 30 love serving for the match and serving for the championship, and then he lost it completely. And uh, there have been a few examples. So then we have the will to win and intent. Again, Nadal, I think there is no other player who can compare to Nadal. And he has himself said it uh, once, I think, that even if one of his shots is working and all of his other shots are not working on a particular day, he will try to use that one shot and try to get the victory. Because for him, only one thing matters, and that is to win somehow or anyhow. If you see his strategy against Federer on the French Open, he always tries to attack Federer's backhand over the years. And even Tony Nadal has confirmed, has said that whenever they play with Federer, he gives one advice to Nadal, and that is whenever you are in trouble, just pepper Federer's backhand and you will get the reward. So this is one of the factors that we need to consider, the will to win and intent. How these two things are uh, related that I just said. This is because for Nadal, it doesn't matter what strategy he uses. The only thing that matters is he needs to get the victory. And whereas for the other guys, or for example, I talk about Federer, usually when you see that his forehand is not working, it's not like he'll try to avoid the forehand. He'll, he'll still try to hit that shot. He'll still try to correct that shot. And sometimes, you know, uh, it's too much to see as a fan that he's missing a lot of shots and then he loses matches uh, because of that, because he's not able to adapt within the match in those conditions, whereas Nadal and Djokovic are usually able to adapt to the condition and to the opponent. Federer usually plays to his strengths. He knows that if he's playing well, he can beat anybody on any surface except Nadal on clay, obviously. But then this also is a weakness because then if you have too much confidence in your abilities, you might not be able to adapt to the conditions or change your tactics when, you know, maybe changing those tactics can result in victories. So that is why we have given more points to Nadal here. Then we have the adaptability within a match. I think it's related to the above point. Again, we have given it to Nadal because whenever his shots are not working, his serve is not working, whatever the case is, he usually finds a way within the match to change his tactic completely. And we have seen it. There are a lot of examples. I'll give one here. The US Open match recently between Nadal and Del Potro, where Del Potro won the first set. Nadal said in the press conference that earlier because Del Potro was coming off of an injury and his forehand is his best shot, his backhand was not working that much. That's why Nadal was trying to always hit to Del Potro's backhand and extract errors from there. But he saw that he lost the set because Del Potro actually started hitting good backhand. So then he completely changed the tactic and he started playing really aggressive tennis and started going more towards Del Potro's forehand, but with power. So the point is, he is able to adjust within a match. Maybe when he sits down after a set, he does some own analysis. He understands what he needs to change within a match. And that is why we see him come back in a lot of matches when he loses the first set or when he loses the second set or he's 5-1 down, 4-1 down. He can usually adjust within the set, within the match. This is something I think is not common between him and Federer. Djokovic, I have given more uh, points because he also is good, is, uh, you know, a great uh, player to adapt. But uh, now, mind you, whenever I'm giving less points to Federer, I'm not saying that he's, he has bad adaptability within a match. He has one of the best adaptability. I'm just saying the relative calculation and not the, you know, overall calculation. So that also we should consider. Then we have the strategy. I would again give the points to Nadal because he knows exactly how to beat the opponent on the other side of the court. He knows his weaknesses, their strengths, and he knows everything that he needs to do to win the match in terms of strategy. That is why you will usually see him approach the net whenever it's required. That is why he misses less volleys. He gets passed lesser times because he knows exactly what needs to be done. Same thing to be considered when he hits a smash and overhead he knows what to do, whether he wants to allow the ball to bounce or not. Passing shot, he is usually spot on with his passing shots. He's able to ability to guess which way the opponent is going to pass him is also very important. You can see French Open 2007 against Roger Federer or some of the shots against Nadal. He actually uh, 
against Djokovic, sorry, you can actually see Nadal, you know, guessing correctly and that is a very important factor, I would say. Uh, so then we have the variety. I think for variety we have given Federer more points because uh, obviously he has a lot of shots and he uses a lot of variety within a specific match. So he has been given 10 points. Then we have the crunch time performance. So we have given 10 points to Nadal here because obviously we have seen time and time again where he saves a lot of break points. Even love 40, I mean, it's so difficult to come back in a match, in a game when you are love 40 down on your serve and also in an important match. And it's not just that he comes back and wins that particular game, he makes it count, right? So he wins the matches based on uh, those uh, crunch time performance aspect. Example wise, we can consider any match, let's say Australian Open 2012 even though he lost the match but if you have seen the uh, fourth set you could have uh, you you would have seen love 40 nadal was down i think it was 4-3 or something and then he was able to save those three points on his terms on his serve and then he was able to win that set and then force a fifth set he led the fifth set 4-2 but then Djokovic came back and won that match in the end you can see his matches against nelbandian i think he was uh, he saved five match points in one match, uh, I think in Indian Wells in 2010, I think. Then uh, we have seen his matches uh, on clay against Federer where he was 5-1 down. I think it was Hamburg uh, in 2008 and he came back from 5-1 down and won the set 7-5. Even in French Open 2011, he was down 2-5 in the first set against Federer in the final. He came back and won the set 7-5. So a lot of times he's able to, you know, come back in a match, play very well on big points whenever it is a break point. If you are able to convert a break point against Nadal, credit to you, you must have played a very good point to win that. But against Pedra, it's not the same. Sometimes he comes to the net quite early, abruptly in a point just so to finish the point soon because he doesn't have confidence from back of the court, especially against Nadal and Djokovic. And that is why he loses a lot of points. And he's also not able to convert a lot of break points. Now, when you face break point against uh, Nadal, you have to play really well to save the break point because Nadal is all over your serve. He will try to hit the winner. He'll take control of the point whenever he has a break point. Whereas for Federer and Djokovic, sometimes they rely on the opponent to miss the shot. And this is where they actually allow the opponent to be back into the point. So that is why I have given 10 to Nadal in terms of the crunch time performance. Then we have the confidence. Again, it's similar to the above point. We have given Nadal more points. Djokovic is also the same. But further, we have given one point less. Then we have the motivation. Now here, I have given nine points to Federer and Nadal. I have given one point less to Djokovic because I have seen, I mean, we have seen after 2016, Djokovic said that he had lost motivation to play and his performance is reflected that because once he won the French Open in 2016, he himself said that one of his biggest goals were achieved and after that he found it uh, difficult to digest uh, this uh, incredible achievement and he definitely lacked motivation as per his own words and you could see that in his performances. I mean, usually he is so good in the finals, but he lost to Wawrinka at the US Open uh, in 2016, I think. And he also lost to the other players on, on the smaller tournaments. But you will never see that with Nadal. <laughs> Nadal will never say that he has lost motivation. I mean, he just never gives up in a single match, whether it is a ATP round-robin match. He's down 1-5 against Medvedev. Still, he'll try to come back and win the match. And he has done that. So there are a lot of proofs where you can safely say that Nadal motivation is, is, you know, uncomparable to Federer and Djokovic. It's better than Federer and Djokovic. I'm not saying that Djokovic and Federer are far behind, but since I have to pick one, I would pick Nadal. Then we have the longevity. Of course, Federer leads in this department. He has been playing for more than 15 years or 20 years now, I would say. And he has been equally consistent, playing well, even though he's losing recently to Djokovic and Nadal, but his performances are good. 
against all the other players and uh, he has been less injured than all the other players usually he doesn't miss any grand slam or any tournament he is able to play that uh, that card very well he knows which tournament to play when to play and because his style of play is is not that uh, you know the style of play is elegant classy his movement is crisp he when you see him play you don't feel that he is you know making a lot of effort so it's it's effortless to see and what his style is and it has resulted actually in his longevity because he doesn't spend that much energy on the court as the other guys do now if federer is playing well you can see a set you know pass by within 20 minutes he's such kind of a guy he never you know takes more time on serving he usually serves out a game if he's serving well in 35 seconds or 40 seconds and then if he's playing well he can also win the set within 20 minutes whereas when you compare it to nadal and djokovic they usually take their time while serving and also in the points they don't like to be rushed they want to keep it uh, you know slow paced at their own pace whereas federer likes quick tennis and that is why i think he doesn't spend that much energy on the court and it has resulted in him getting less injured and that has contributed in turn to his longevity then we have talent of course federer i think is the most talented of all given him 10 points and then djokovic and nadal i have given equal points then we have consistency i think nadal has been the most consistent player of course when he is injured he has been injured the most he has missed a lot of tournaments but whenever he is back i think he plays his best tennis and i think he is the best player uh, you know who who plays his best after making a comeback from an injury now federer or djokovic whenever they come back from an injury they usually take a lot of matches lot of tournaments to get back into the groove but nadal usually when he makes a comeback more or less he starts playing well from the beginning and he doesn't face any you know issues like the mental you know mental blocks coming back after an injury or all those kinds of stuff he is already there prepared present in the moment and that is why we have given him more points there then we have the era adaptability i think we have discussed this point already we have given this to federer because the court surfaces the conditions the rackets all that have changed but federer has been able to adapt to all of this quite well he has been able to play different style of games he has been able to serve and volley against sampras he has also been able to rally well against nadal on clay and similarly he has been able to rally well against djokovic on the hard courts so he is the player i think over the years all his colleagues have mostly retired the fellow players have become commentators or coaches but federer has seen that era of the of tennis he has played in those conditions well and then he has also transitioned his game to suit the present conditions and that is why i have given him more points then we have the court coverage i think nadal has to be given the most points here and this is overall on the surfaces of course nadal is the best on clay whereas djokovic i think is the best in the australian open the way he can glide on the court i think he is the best uh, you know court coverage that he has at the australian open surface specifically now he also slides on the us open court but i think us open court surface is a bit different and people are able to hit more winners because the court is faster and the ball bounces higher on that surface as compared to the australian open but overall the court coverage whether it is a hard court or clay or grass if you combine it you know in the span of last 15 years 20 years you will see that nadal has the best court coverage when he was young when nadal was young i mean there was very very less chance that you could hit a winner against him you can see his match i was watching his match recently against piotta in the french open 2005 final and i mean he was everywhere and you can see his match against korea i think it was in 2005 as well on clay in one of the tournaments i think it was rome you can see uh, his uh, you know reach his court coverage throughout i mean it it never looked like there is a there is a chance of hitting a winner in the open court because he was everywhere then we have the dominance factor now obviously this has to go to federer because the way he dominated from 2004 to 2007 i think nobody has dominated uh, you know in that regard uh, consistently staying world number 1 for 237 weeks and dominating everybody and you can 
if you watch those matches of those times you can hear the commentators you can hear the fans everybody was like seeing magic in front of their eyes when they saw Federer play when he was in his prime and it's true that nadal was his nemesis and nadal still you know beat him even in those days on clay and some of the hard courts so you can see him you know beat federer in 2006 dubai open then he was able to beat him on clay obviously and uh, but i still think the dominance factor lies with federer because he was beating all the players other players so easily in their matches and some players also said that when they try to go and play against federer they already know that they have lost the match so there was an aura of invincibility that federer had between 2004 and 2007 and that is why we have given the dominance factor now in 2011 and also in 2015 2016 jokovic had a similar aura he was also considered unbeatable but i think the period of 2004 to 2007 if you can see all those matches whether it is a small tournament or big tournament or grand slam whatever it is you will find federer's dominance was unmatched so when you sum this all up you can see 138 points go to federer 143 to nadal and 136 to djokovic so nadal leads in this category overall okay so now we come to the head to head so head to head uh there are different statistics mentioned here the first table that you can see is all the tournaments overall they have played matches against each other and it shows you the percentage that has been won then it also shows you the grand slams the atp masters and the atp finals then we have the next table which is on the specific surface and then on at the last we have the head to head record so you can see overall uh, that djokovic leads both against federer and nadal head to head he has won 60% of the matches combined against nadal and federer and even on these surfaces you can see on the hard courts 62% he has won on clay it's 34% and on grass it's 63% and interestingly if you see roger federer on grass he has 50% record against djokovic and nadal this is primarily because he has lost uh, three finals to djokovic at wimbledon So here if you see this comparison there is no doubt that Novak Djokovic comes out on top in terms of the head to head analysis he leads both of the players and even on clay i think he is the closest to nadal he has been able to beat nadal a lot of times on clay and uh, also federer he has been able to beat federer so i think uh, in that regard head to head i will give the points to Novak Djokovic Okay now we come to the records itself so we have the grand slam titles federer has won 20 nadal has won 20 djokovic recently won the french open so he also has 19 here and here i will also put the key stack so these are again my personal opinions so i consider grand slam as a key fact that's why i have given it as a yes here then we have the masters 1000 so again nadal and djokovic are tied at 36 and 36 then we have the atp finals now interestingly nadal has not won a single atp finals title in his career but federer has six of them and djokovic has five of them at the olympics nadal leads because he has the gold medal there federer has the silver medal and djokovic has the bronze medal in terms of the world number 1 ranking weeks federer was the best for a long time but recently djokovic overtook him and now it is 324 weeks for djokovic and counting i think it's more now after the french open so definitely he leads in that department and then we have the total atp titles that is combining the grand slams and all the masters tournaments i think it's 103 for federer he has the most titles among these three guys then uh, nadal has 88 and djokovic is just behind nadal at 84 then we have the head to head we already seen jokovic leads this category so when you compare all these stats that i have mentioned in this list overall i think jokovic leads these critical records because grand slam titles masters 1000s atp finals the world number 1 ranking and the head to head i think these are the five factors that i consider as the key stats and in these stats i think that jokovic excels when compared to the other two players
okay now this slide is a bit hypothetical what could have been so there are a lot of matches in the history where you know the things would have changed significantly had the result been different so we start off with the 2006 french open federer was playing really well he had lost nadal at the french open in 2005 and uh, at that time people were already saying that federer is the goat because he is winning all the matches he is dominating and the only weakness he had at that time was his backhand and he improved it significantly at the beginning of 2006 and when you see his backhand in 2006 I still think it was the best backhand he he had even though he again improved it in 2017 but still I think 2006 was his best year on his backhand and he had his best chance in the French Open if you see the match in Rome that was a five setter Federer had match points in Rome against Nadal it was 15-40 he had four hands lined up he missed those four hands he lost the match but again at the French Open in the final he won the first set 6-1 and he was playing unbelievable tennis at that time everybody thought that this is the year Federer will be winning the French Open but he let Nadal come back into the match he uh, first of all started playing defensively towards the uh, middle of the match and then continued to be defensive whereas in the first set he looked a lot confident now mind you from the second set onwards Nadal also started playing aggressively but Federer should have you know kept the aggression going so that he sh he could have been in touch with Nadal in terms of the strategy and in terms of the score but it was not to be he lost the second set on a similar score line which was 1-6 to Nadal and in the third set it was a tight affair there was I think two all and Federer had two or three break points it was love 40 to Nadal and uh, Federer missed an easy forehand on one of the break points in on the closer to the net and even the commentators you know said that this is a huge miss because after that game Nadal went on to hold that uh, game hold his serve and in the next game he was able to break Federer and from that point onwards it was always an uphill task for Federer to come back into the match had he won the 2006 French Open I think it would have opened the gates for Federer in the upcoming French Opens uh, from you know 2007 onwards and he would not have been chasing Nadal in terms of uh, the overall ability and if he would have you know won the French Open 2006 I think he, he would have gained much more confidence against Nadal also on the other surfaces so I think that was an important match then we have the 2009 Australian Open where Federer lost in the fifth set he also cried during the presentation ceremony he was going for his 14th Grand Slam he was trying to break Sampras's record but I think the way he played the fifth set was very disappointing he made more than 15 unforced errors in the fifth set and he literally gave it away to Nadal who was just putting the ball back into play in the fifth set and it's not like he was defending really well Federer was just trying to go for winners and he was missing a lot of balls so <clears throat> I think that was an important match had Federer won the Australian Open 2009 I think he would have completed the you know the 14 Grand Slam titles and also he would have gained much more confidence against Nadal because mind you up till then in terms of Grand Slams Nadal had not beaten Federer on a hard court in a Grand Slam he had beaten Federer in 2008 Wimbledon okay he had beaten Federer on clay at the French Open but he had not beaten Federer at the Australian Open or the US Open by that time so Federer if he would have won Australian Open because confidence is a really important factor for Federer the belief is an important factor I think Federer would have improved his belief that on hard courts and on grass still Federer would have the upper hand but it was not to be and you can see after that match even on hard courts Federer played Nadal at the Australian Open 2012 he lost at the Australian Open 2014 again he lost so then Federer started losing against Nadal also on the hard court so that invincible thing was going away slowly and slowly from the Federer's cabinet then we have the 2013 French Open match against Djokovic and Nadal now Djokovic and Nadal I know Djokovic was trying a lot to beat Nadal at the French Open he had played Nadal a lot of times already but 2013 I think he had the best chance 
it was a five set match although nadal had served for the match in the fourth set twice and still he was not able to succeed but in the fifth set jokovic led with a break he was up 4-1 4-2 he had 30 all he had chances to win that match but then nadal came back he hit a lot of winners whole credit to nadal i don't think jokovic played badly in the fifth set but nadal just took the match away from jokovic based on his absolutely incredible mental strength and ability to hit winners at the most opportune moments had jokovic won that match at the french open i think 2014 french open would have been much more closer as well maybe jokovic would have won it easily and uh, also i think it would have helped jokovic to win the other tournaments against nadal because it would have given him a lot of confidence then we have the 2008 federer and nadal wimbledon now i really give credit for this match to the previous match that happened just a month prior to this match which was the french open 2008 because the way nadal was able to beat federer in that match federer's psyche got impacted he was really short of confidence in his match against nadal and in the beginning of that match you can see the first couple of sets federer was not able to hit his backhand well he was so not sure unsure on his backhand he was just trying to put the ball in play and nadal was able to be aggressive and attack that shot and that is why he lost those both the sets 6-4 and 6-4 i think and in the third set federer started using his forehand more started running around his backhand more and started improving his serve and i think the match would have had a different result had federer not been meet, beaten in that way in the french open had he won the first set or the second set at the french open maybe the match would have been more competitive all these things would have helped federer at wimbledon and i think uh, we'll discuss that match in another video in the of the french open 2008 but i think this match if federer would have won he would have got six wimbledon titles and i think he would have maintained his dominance on grass and against nadal on all the other surfaces except clay but that was not to be then we have the australian open 2011 now nadal was going for his career grand slam he was trying to win his fourth consecutive grand slam but he got injured in the quarter final i think against david ferrer and he was able to continue that match but he was not able to perform his best and that is why he lost in straight sets and if he would have won that match i think he would have completed the career grand slam and that would have been a significant uh, you know factor in his overall career then we have the matches in uh, you know us open 2011 wimbledon 2019 basically all those matches where federer had match points multiple match points but he failed to convert and then he lost those matches the most uh, hurting one was the recent wimbledon 2019 where he had hit two aces in the final game to get to 40 15 when he was serving for the match and uh, the championship and then he made uh, you know one error and also jokovic hit a, an amazing passing shot so i think that was the match that federer should have won and also the us open 2011 he also had chances in 2010 so a lot of matches are there so had federer won a few of those matches i think he would have had more grand slams and more tournaments but this is all what could have been the facts are different the reality is different so let's move on So all those factors that we have discussed in this video I have just collated them here and just calculated all the points just summed up all the points so we have the technical game we have the performance aspect the surfaces the miscellaneous aspect the records head to head and grand slam titles when you total it up you can see that Nadal actually leads with 378 points Djokovic is not that far behind with 376 points and Federer has 364 points. So if you go with this analysis, uh, you can see that Nadal leads the points tally. Djokovic is not far behind. So if he wins one more Grand Slam, if he wins more tournaments, then of course he can overtake Nadal. And same applies for Federer and Nadal because both those players are also active on the two tour. So I think this is what the result of this analysis is now. 
as i said in the beginning of this video that you know the heart says a different thing and the mind says a different thing for me personally my idol is roger federer and he'll always be roger federer because i think uh, for me the most uh, important things are the dominance that federer had between 2004 and 2007 then the talent i think uh, he is the most talented player of all and also the third factor is the effortless style of play the class the elegance that he brings on court so for for me these three factors you know conquer all the other factors and no matter who uh, you know if somebody tells me that you know nadal has won more grand slams or djokovic is the most complete player all those factors are valid but it doesn't matter to me because my idol is federer similarly i think all of you would have your own idols and you would consider maybe different players as greatest of all times based on our, your own understanding your own stats so even though the stats here say that nadal is the best but for me federer will always be the best and some of you or some of the people also may have started you know watching tennis a little late or maybe a little early but i cannot comment on that i can just say that i started watching tennis from 2002 2003 and when i watched federer play there was no nadal there was no djokovic but the way federer played and the way he dominated on court i mean at that time i was also supporting the underdogs i wanted other players to beat federer because his dominance was somewhat making the tennis boring because he was playing so well there was no chance to any other players so i cannot forget that dominance that he had now and then the court surfaces changed nadal and djokovic got better of him they played better and then they were able to beat him eventually and then he you know lost in the head to head record as well earlier in his career he had a greater good head to head record against nadal and against djokovic on all the other surfaces of course on clay he didn't have a head to head record against nadal because he was always losing to uh, losing to nadal on clay but overall i think because those factors don't affect me I still believe that Federer is the greatest of all time but the statistics some of the statistics you know don't agree with me and that is why I say it's a hypothetical question so you guys can do your own anal- analysis put down your comments in this video what what you think are the factors that I have missed and what are the factors where you think I am incorrect based on your own understanding and you can also decide who is your goat based on the factors and giving your own points so i hope you like this analysis and thanks for watching